if, if, if you were here and saw the, the wireless uh, panel, Gary Hunter with AT&T. Uh, we have uh, John Reed from Charter. We have uh, Carl Hemke with Valentium, and we have Christian Alt Altenberger with Comcast. So uh, the three industry representatives, and I think these three companies are the, probably the three largest providers of broadband video and data services in, in the country, uh, in no particular order, order here. And uh, so they're going to talk about, as with the wireless panel, just what's going on specifically with their companies, their approach to, uh, to this market, to this technology, uh, to all relevant uh, uh, conditions. And then Carl is going to provide some perspective on the implications, as, as I think we do every year, of, of, of what's happening now, the implications for valuation, or at least the implications that we think are of most interest to, to, to those of you here, and that is largely in uh, an ad valorem tax uh, context. Uh, I'm Jeff Binkley, and you may be asking, or may have always asked, why is he here? Well, uh, if nothing else, trivia. So um, this conference, I, I think it's coincidental. I don't know, Larry, it may be otherwise, but we, we always coincide with the Chinese New Year. So uh, I don't know if that's purposeful or something, but, but anyway, we do. So first trivia question, here we go. 2020 is the year of the, raise your hand, raise, raise your hand, because I can't give this to everybody. Who, uh, Dave, I think you got it. It is the rat. 2020 is the year of the rat. That's the first year that the Chinese zodiac cycle starts again. Year one is the year of the rat. There you go. These are 25 Starbucks, so year of the rat. It's also election year here, isn't it? Maybe. Yeah, year of the rat. Say no more. Uh, okay. Uh, we also uh, coincide fairly closely with the Super Bowl. So do have a couple of Super Bowl questions here. Uh, Dave, you may have to disqualify yourself. You already got one, and um, being from Kansas City, one of these might be easy, but uh, not going to make it too easy. We've all heard and seen that it's been 50 years since the Chiefs were in a Super Bowl. 1970, they won, right? But I'm not going to ask you about that. Uh, in what year did the Kansas City Chiefs first compete in a Super Bowl? In what year did the Chiefs first compete? Richard. Uh, no, Brad. Yes, sir, Brad. 1967, that was the, and I'm about, the first Super Bowl against the Green Bay Packers, correct. There we go. Okay, 1967. Some of us were around then. So, so. Some of us may be old enough to even remember watching the game. I don't know. Uh, okay. Uh, Chiefs are good, but they're playing a team that looks really uh, uh, like they're really going to be challenged. 49ers. 49ers uh, back years ago were a uh, perennial Super Bowl participant, it seems like, but it's been a while. It's been a while. Uh, it was the last year when the 49ers won a Super Bowl? Not appeared, they appeared more recently. When did the 49ers win a Super Bowl? Who am I? Oh, over, over here. Yes. Uh, no, no. What year in which did they win the Super Bowl? I'm sorry, Richard. That's correct. It was the 94 season, but the question was, in what year did they win the Super Bowl? And it was January 1995. Correct. Here we go. It was the 94 season, but both of those questions, <laughs> in both of those questions, I asked, in what year did they win the Super Bowl? Yeah, I was, I was careful to say that because I knew you were going to do that. And, I, you know, also that was the 66 season when the uh, Chiefs won, but it was played in 1967, correct. Okay, got a couple more here. And these could have conceivably different answers, too. Uh, I went from the same source on these. Uh, 
And so, uh, but if nobody gets the correct one, if they get probably what second or other indices indicate, might, might give you that. But uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to be the judge, so, uh, uh, and as, as fair as possible. Uh, what major city in the world has the fastest mean, and this is mean or average, broadband download speeds. What city in the world do you think has the fastest? Augie. That's not true. A lot of people think that, but it is not. What city? <laughs> How'd you know? What city in the world? I, uh, uh, you you got to go south of Seoul. You, you got to go south of Seoul. Uh, no. Yes, sir. Singapore. Singapore has the fastest. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, uh, 176. And that's the mean for, for 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 the city. This is the you know the 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 question is 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 the mean. So I've got one more. And I got to see what it is. I think I've got one more. Ah, uh, guess Just I give gave us your them credit all away. Card. Um, <laughs> But I do have another question I was going to ask. This is a binary choice, so I wasn't going to give a prize on this because we just have to raise hands. But of the Super Bowl participants, cities, and I'm just going to get boat, uh, between the two cities, which one of the two do you think has the highest mean broadband Download speeds mean for the city. Okay, who who said San Francisco? Who says Kansas City? It is Kansas City. And interestingly enough, this is per Forbes magazine. Okay, uh, interestingly enough, the top five. Kansas City. What do you think? Second. That should be pretty easy. Austin. There we go. Austin. Uh, and the top five round out are Lubbock, Texas, Raleigh, and San Antonio. Four of these five have something in common. Four of these five, four of the top five have something in common. Does anybody know what it is? Yes, it is. They have Google Fiber. That's correct. Four out of the top five have Google Fiber. That has two effects. They don't have a ton of customers anywhere, but the customers they have have higher speeds and also their presence, uh, uh, I suppose, has uh, contributed to uh, investment by competitors as well. So, so, yeah, believe it or not, in Kansas City, you know, Singapore 176, uh, they are around 150 compared to Memphis 44. That's the lowest in the country. So, you know, we talked earlier about the, you know, ur urban rural gap, but there's there, there's a, there's a substantial gap between uh, these cities at the top and those uh, at the at at the lower end. Substantial. Okay, uh, Gary, uh, you want to start with uh, what's going on with AT and T? Sure. I'm going to kind of get a little bit of a historical perspective on it because I think it'll bring it into context. So, <clears throat> 2005, 2006 time period, um, Verizon started with its FIOS and AT&T went a little different route where it went with fiber to the node for its U-verse light speed deployment. And it was fiber route to, to the neighborhoods and then, and then it was copper for the remaining part of it. There was 
you can argue on the strategy that that was that was their strategy um, and we rolled that forward to where we were had video product called Uverse TV and in our broadband 2012 2013 time period you know and that followed um, 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 a lot of different um, challenges we had a recession and so forth um, they came out with project VIP and, and in conjunction with that they decided it wasn't cost effective to deploy fiber or to upgrade um, a lot of the rural areas and ultimately that led to you know and we're having some challenges with the um, Uverse TV and so forth the, mainly the high content costs we ended up buying direct TV and as part of that um, transaction um, we agreed that we would pass and deploy fiber out to I think 12 million homes if I remember right also what we indicated and we got agreement on is is in for the rural areas we could use alternative technologies I fix wireless um, and <clears throat> from our perspective that it wasn't cost-effective to deploy like I said, fiber or copper in, in, in rural areas for broadband. And so we deployed a um, fixed wireless solution in, the, in those rural areas. Initially, I think it was, it was um, 10 megabits, which was at that time was, if you remember, the FCC um, redefined what minimum broadband speeds were. Today, that's around 25 megabits. Um, as we rolled out fiber, and it's called at t Fiber, one of the things that we've noticed is you know, between the competition um, as well as technology, one of the things that, that you know, has been driving a lot of our investment decisions the last couple of years is, is the um, fiber to the node type technologies do not have sufficient speeds to be competitive in the marketplace. Um, you get anything, and from our perspective, you get anything below 40 megabits, and we, we were seeing a lot of churn and a lot of so forth. And so we made a pretty concerted effort the last three years to deploy fiber out to, um, I think it was late last year, out to 14 million homes. Um, and we've seen significant better um, um, take rates. It's a lot more competitive product. Um, project. It also fits in with, with our strategy on, with, in terms of 5G and the wireless um, um, network because you need fiber for the backhaul um, and you know we'll talk a little bit later about this but but also in conjunction with the fiber deployment um, nearly 70% um, of it was an overbuild situation and when we start talking about valuation um, topics here in a little bit I'll bring that back into context and, and how you know when we look at it from a valuation perspective there's an impact from doing an overbuild, um, and in, in that overbuild being where we, as I said, either we've deployed fiber, where there's just only copper only type um, um, outside plant facilities, or in conjunction with trying to leverage some of the copper facilities to further push out that fiber to the home. Let, let me make sure I under, understood, maybe everybody else did. So, so you've got fiber to the, to the premises if, uh, covering 14 million? Homes? Correct. Okay. Thanks. That's, that's significant, especially with a lot of it being an overbuild. I, I didn't know it was that much, so that's. So at Charter, um, you know, we had a major merger back in 2016 with Time Warner Cable uh, and Bright House Networks. Over the last two, two and a half years, a lot of the time and efforts have been spent around the integration of all those assets to try and unify and have an integrated approach for everything across the country. Um, so a lot of our, our CapEx spend the last two plus years has been geared towards that. Uh, I think last year here at the conference, I said our fiber percentage of, as a part of our network was about 10%. I actually went back and looked at it again. Uh, I must have rounded up. It was 9.5% last year. And at the end of 2019, it's only grown to 10.7, so 11%, um, which compared to another cable company is drastically lower because we have not been able to deploy as m much of our capital spend towards fiber, uh, which is becoming increasingly important. Um, and our CapEx for the first time uh, in, since the merger uh, for year in 19 should be 
coming in around $2 billion lower than it was in 2018. 2018 approached $9 billion, and now for 2019 it should be just under $7 billion. Um, a lot of those costs went towards that integration. Um, the one thing that's even more noticeable, and, and Comcast, uh, their numbers reflected that that they announced today, uh, ours are similar, will be similar. Um, we keep adding broadband internet customers, uh, hundreds of thousands per quarter, compared to video losses quarter after quarter after quarter. Um, at Q3, which is the last date we reported, we haven't reported Q4 yet, um, we had approximately one and a half, slightly more than one and a half broadband customers compared to video. And that, that customer base is becoming increasingly important compared to the video customers. There's so much competition now on the video front that the broadband customers are becoming far and away the, the majority of our customer base. Well, John, then, then I mean, that's a significant increase, actually, in, 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 in the proportion of, of fiber to your total, um, to, total plant, if you will. But given that growth in data subscribers, it, 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 is that not going to push the CapEx back up? Because, I mean, you're in the same market as AT&T, and if those market characteristics are the same, it's, it seems like that... that that, that, that you're, you're going to be obliged to, to, to push fiber further out at potentially uh, a more rapid pace. Is that, is that a fair assumption? Yeah, the, the, the CapEx spend for fiber will go up. A lot of the spend that we were seeing, the 7 right. to 9 difference, that was a lot of CPE. Right, so that doesn't mean your getting, total CapEx getting will Getting consistent up. CPE across the company. Um, each legacy company had their own CPE. And it was about getting a consistent product out into the market. Okay, and uh, I'll share some some information on what's going on at Comcast, uh, both recently and over the past couple of years. Uh, as John mentioned, we released fourth quarter <clears throat> and 2019 year-end uh, financial results today. So just wanted to share a couple things from that. Uh, similar to John, we we added 1.4 million broadband customers in 2019, which is actually the highest amount that we've added in over 12 years, which is pretty mind-boggling to me given how much broadband has grown over that 12 years that, that we could still be hitting a, a new high number now in 2019. Um, we're reaching penetration on broadband close to 50%, um, which, which I don't think uh, really anyone thought we'd get back over 50% penetration a couple years ago on, on maybe any product. but. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty wild how that, that business continues just to grow at a, at a breakneck speed. I'm not sure who these 1.4 million people are <laughs> that don't have broadband in 2019. Um, maybe their, uh, their competitor, um, customers, but, um, but I'm not sure. Is that a plug for a strong economy? <laughs> yeah, I guess we'll find out next, right? <clears throat> yeah, maybe it's new households. We'll, we'll see. Um, and then overall, really what Comcast has focused on in the past few years is really product differentiation. Um, you know, the speeds are speeds. Um, there's a number of providers that can offer very high broadband speeds. And now with 5G, um, there'll be a whole new list of competitors offering high speed um, uh, products. So we've... Uh, already developed on the video side our X1 platform, which has been a great success in a, you know, in admittedly a, a dying revenue stream, but um, but it is still very important for us. And the X1 product has reduced churn significantly, and we've seen much better uh, stickiness of our cust video customers compared to some of the other um, linear video offering uh, companies. On the broadband side, we spent a lot of time over the past two years uh, with our X5 broadband management platform. And if you live in a Comcast market, you've probably seen these commercials. Um, one I think is pretty clever. Uh, it's, it's a teenage daughter or a teenage girl in her room, her boyfriend sneaking in through the window, and the dad comes in and goes, oh, you must be uh, Johnny's iPhone, <laughs> uh, which just connected to your network. Uh, I think that was 
pretty clever one. Um, <clears throat> Uh, we've, we're rolling out a new Wi-Fi 6 advanced gateway this year, uh, which we talked about a little earlier. It has theoretical maximum speeds of uh, up to 9 gigabits per second over Wi-Fi. Um, obviously, we're not there yet on, on any level, but um, that's pretty wild to think that, that you can get speeds that high over Wi-Fi. Um, and, and we'll see if we can get there over with the you know, any new <coughs> DOCSIS uh, advancements in overall speeds. Uh, to give some other information on that, you know, back when Wi-Fi 5 standard was out, the average number of devices in each home uh, was five. It's now close to 10. And Comcast power users, which I think we define as our top either one or 5% of, of data users, average 50 connected devices. <laughs> so. I'm not sure <laughs> what those 50 that, devices that are. Do they have that many or that? No, these are residential power users. Yeah, so I'm not sure Any, what. Anybody <laughs> here got 50 devices? Or yeah. Did, Maybe you, it's wanted, you, you want to admit that? Uh, yeah. You know, I guess with a smart home, you could you could certainly have. Yeah, you could have a lot with it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, with light bulbs, door locks, start, uh, everything. I think that's um, what it would. Yeah, yeah, so I guess it could be something along yeah. those lines. Alexa, how many do you have? Now this, there you go. Um, another interesting thing that we've uh, really kind of leaned into is obviously the over the top and the streaming services. Uh, we recently announced a, a new streaming service uh, known as Peacock um, that we'll be rolling out shortly. But it's interesting to see how we're rolling that out. Um, I think we're we're doing it much more as an ad based model versus a subscription model such as you know Netflix or or Apple TV. Um, and it will be available for free to any broadband customer that we have. Um, and we are providing actually an X1 uh, cable box to all of our broadband customers. You get one for free. Um, you don't get linear television channels with it, but you get 15,000 hours of on-demand content, um, a number of news and, and sports content. Uh, it automatically brings in all of your other over-the-top subscriptions. Um, so you'll see Netflix and Amazon prominently displayed. Um, we don't have integration with any Disney services, but, but all the other major ones are, are there um, with a voice control remote. So you'll be able to search for content, and it'll be displayed um, right in front of you on your screen to watch uh, with your options for watching it if it's available on multiple services. Um, so I think it's, it's a really innovative way to kind of tackle the um, the over the top and the the streaming wars on the on the video side, um, and one interesting thing that sort of came out of that for me, a realization, and and looking at some of the financial results and everything else, is that I, I almost wonder if if it's preferred um, to to keep um, adding the broadband customers versus video customers as. The margins are higher on broadband customers. You don't have the programming and content costs that you do on the video side, um, so there is, you know, there is definitely a higher margin on the broadband side. So it, it's definitely an interesting strategy to see how, how everyone is approaching it. Um, and then on the technology side, the big innovation, um, or not even innovation, but the big push for the last couple of years has been fiber. Obviously, we're pushing it further and further closer to the customers, doing, um, we've been doing a lot of node splits, getting deeper in the neighborhoods, less customers per node. Um, it is a shared connection from the node, so obviously uh, that created some bottlenecks in you know, prime times when everyone's streaming and um, in a busy neighborhood. Uh, we are doing going to a full fiber deep uh, deployment over the next few years, and that fiber deep deployment uh, is, the one we're using is is known as n plus zero, so that means that there is um, no need for amplification once you get off of fiber onto the coax. You're within typically a thousand feet of every customer premise, um, and that enables a much cleaner network. Um, you get rid of all the amplification noise. You get rid of the amplifiers and the power supplies themselves. Um, it, there can be significant OPEX uh, as well as performance benefits to that. And then uh, RemoteFi is a technology that's related to uh, how we're deploying the fiber deep now. 
and the remote phi takes some of the functionality of the head end and the cable modem uh, termination system routers and puts it in the node. And so that being closer to the customer enables you to offer um, just a more efficient service, better speeds um, overall. And, and Carl is going to touch on that a little bit now uh, as we get into sort of where, uh, where, where this all leads. Yeah, th there are particular uh, valuation implications for for all uh, all of this, because you know you you've got again for Advorm tax purposes you've got a legacy network and a value to consider at a fixed point in time. None of this is fixed. It's 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 moving, and the uh, standard uh, is something that is being developed. So uh, it's a challenge to deal with the valuation of a, quote, current status, which is really a legacy network. And Carl's going to talk about uh, the implications of that in terms of a replacement standard, which is, is, is something altogether different, but then how that can be reconciled and give you uh, a meaningful view of, uh, of, of how to incorporate all of these uh, factors related to both market conditions and technology into valuation with that. Carl? Thank you. Um, so let's jump to this next slide. I'm, I did this little cheat um, computer here because I cannot see this one over here. And I cannot even change the slide. There we go. So we, we hear from different providers of uh, broadband capacity, whether it's a cable company or whether it's a, a traditional telecommunication company. Uh, what we don't, we, we heard about it uh, like a, a Google Fiber, kind of a traditionally or, or originating as a fiber company. They're all trying to, to take one thing, take the internet and deliver it to a customer, right? And so how they do that is differently. Um, how they have done it historically and how they're having to augment their system over time, um, Gary talked about overbuild, um, they're all having to augment their system and so and they're all having to do it differently but yet they're all coming back together as, as, as one common way of, of doing it. So we'll, we'll talk through that um, as we uh, move through these slides. But uh, there is uh, one more trivia question, but uh, the, the, the trivia question is uh, who is on that TV screen on the left-hand side? Anybody know that, uh, that show? I Put the slide. Try that slide, okay. Anybody, anybody? 30 years ago. Who's over 30 years old here? <laughs> I'm sorry? The, it is not the bionic woman. Close, uh, we're close, not, close. We're, we're actually talking on the TV, not the, not the, uh, the lady sitting in front of the TV. Can but uh, I cannot. But uh, who, who played the bionic woman, Jason? <laughs> I can on my screen, but uh, so it's the facts of life. Right, so that we Lindsay got, uh, Wack, yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so what, what was happening 30 years ago is, you know, a family was together and now, lo now they're no longer, but, but no, they're all sitting together in front of a TV <laughs> walking or looking at uh, the facts of life and, and enjoying it on one screen, right? So we're today, whether they're doing it on the VCR or TV or, um, you know, they've had 40 to 50 channels to choose from. Um, today, everybody's focused on their device or, or doing whatever they want to do on their computer, focused on really what the, they personally want to do as opposed to a, a family, which is kind of sad, but uh, um, using on-demand, uh, streaming, Netflix, DVR. So that's the, the transition of what's, what's doing that is that, um, or the implication of that, I should say, is that uh, broadband capacity is dramatically increasing, right? So. Um, the demand for broadband capacity. And this, this follows a, uh, it's called the Nielsen's Law, um, a 50% growth rate every year. So that's a significant growth rate. It's not, I mean, you're looking at a, um, a logarithmic graph here. So each order of, each number going forward is, is an order of magnitude. So if you're looking at a Cartesian graph, it'd go, go straight up as a hockey stick. But uh, so that's, that's a fast, um, imp the, the networks have to change because they don't just automatically give you more speed because you ask for more speed. Um, so what, what are the, the companies doing to respond? Um, well, 
back in kind of that first building that you saw, that's the head end and hub and, and central office. Uh, what's happening for the cable companies, as uh, Christian said, is they're moving the technology out of the head ends and pushing it into the, the network, uh, further on into the network, into the nodes, and some even the, of the capacity into the customer prem equipment. Um, you know, Larry talked about early on is that the whole uh, idea of this conference is really forecasting substitution, what what technology is substituting one for the other. So the value implications are is when you're taking and changing something from it, a technology and moving it to another technology, the technology that you're moving it from becomes obsolete, right? It, its useful life becomes much shorter because now it's no longer economically useful and uh, it, 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 it terminates. And so even though you've spent a lot of money on that, um, it's it's quickly a lot of the useful lives are being are shrinking because of the need for a constant upgrade and changing of the network. In a uh, you know, cable network, docs in Doxus 3.1, where they're primarily first focusing on, on up, updating their their uh, customer prem equipment, but also moving more fiber out into the network, going to a fiber deep strategy, uh, using uh, kind of a remote fi strategy, or again moving equipment out of the head ends and pushing it into the distribution network. The other thing that they're doing is what's called node splits. And so a node is where you take, um, and we'll maybe look at a, uh, I'm confusing myself with a, uh, with two different computers here, but um, take a look at a node split here on this, this line where in the original network or in a current network, you have, you know, a head end is, is uh, pictured on the left, or at least these boxes, you're moving fiber to a node, and then you're converting to a, a, a coax system to distribute that network. Well, what you're having to do is that you have this kind of parent-child relationship where you have this, this primary node, and then ultimately you need to split it, and you did you know double the number of nodes that are out there so you can get closer fiber or more fiber closer to the customer, uh, more capacity. Having more capacity allows you... Uh, um, to provide those higher broadband speeds. So. Right, and that is a shared connection from the node. So the, the lower the amount of customers on each node, the, the higher level of service you can offer. So that's, that's one of the things that uh, the cable companies are doing. Of course, the, um, the telecommunication companies are, are, have moved more fiber and nodes further out into the, uh, their network as well as just simply providing fiber all the way to the customer, to the 12 million customers that, that Gary talked about. Um, I think in both cases, um, in, in, in general, everybody is putting in fiber to the prem in a new net, in a new subdivision. So if you, it's a brand new subdivision, we're putting in fiber to the prem. We're avoiding all of these changes that that, that we need to make in the in the future. So yeah, where it's cost effective. I mean, I think Jim pointed out. I think it was you that pointed out that um, you get below what is it, 15 homes per linear mile. It's not cost effective to deploy it. So that's, I mean, that's an effect why we can't afford to deploy in rural areas fiber, so. Yeah, and to give some color on, on the fiber deployment on Comcast side, as I talked about fiber deep, um, Comcast has doubled the amount of fiber root miles um, in our network in the past five years. Um, and you consider that we're a, a nationwide company, it's a very significant amount of miles and in investment. So how do we how do we measure this this change? Um, you know, you can you can kind of envision what's being reported to the jurisdictions, and we're in a property tax uh, context. What's being reported is historically what has been spent, right? And so, if you take that historical spend and you simply trend it times just generic trending tables, then it it really is nowhere close to what is a true replacement cost new, which is in a fundamental uh, determination of value. You should it's called the principal substitution. What would I start with if I were to start all over again today? That's really the economic beginning point where um, kind of the, the methods that are used today in, in assessments are trending historical costs. And so that's the big disconnect that, that we're seeing and, and how to really kind of quickly or more correctly quantify value is provide the jurisdictions with a replacement cost new and then of course um, depreciate that further. Um, replacement cost new is uh, it's it's just easier to estimate what is the, the beginning point. Whereas a if you take a historical cost and you, then you say okay how much of that is kind of 
replacements and rebuilds and, and you know, how many times do we do it again and again? It just, it's too onerous to, to go through a fixed asset schedule and, and make those modifications. Um, it's, it's much more clean to determine uh, essentially what are the, what we call, uh, what Jim calls uh, the P's and the Q's, right? So determining what is the price of all the components that's required to build that network to uh, how many components are there. And so it's P times Q is, is essentially the replacement cost new in a very kind of simplified uh, way of thinking about it. Um, how do you uh, uh, do that? So, you know, it's, it's a very model-driven approach that, that Jim does. Uh, Jim with CostQuest uh, pr determines that uh, number of quantities, right? So whether it's running down different streets today as opposed to running down the streets that were there years ago, it's, it's, it's optimizing the network. It's, it's uh, using the proper equipment, using today's technologies, uh, where, where you would simply build it and have different quantities uh, for those, uh, those units. Uh, but that's, that's essentially the best way of doing that. Now, how does that really compare to a uh, kind of that, we talked about the filing or the return that's being filed and then what happens at the uh, many assessing jurisdictions is that they take this, and I just put in some, some numbers here as an example. Um, you know, the filing comes in, it's 590, we'll call it million dollars, and then uh, you apply that to some trends because things cost more every year, right? Inflation is two to three percent, depending upon the, the year that you're, you're looking at. Um, that's true for general CPI, but not necessarily true for the technology. But applying those, those general trends to a historical cost uh, gives you a, a higher number. Well, there's a problem with that because um, that cost, that new 660, as we'll call, uh, call it, uh, includes uh, excess cost. It, it includes the fact that it was suboptimally deployed into your network. It, it, in, it, in, it includes that, um, that you've positively trended your assets when in reality these assets are reducing in cost every year because of the, the cost per technology uh, of what's there is, is dramatically reducing. So that really kind of describes the difference between a trended his historical cost to a a replacement cost new. Hey, Carl, would you go back to the telecom RCN example? That one or the? No, the, the, the architecture one. That, that's yeah, telecom. So, yeah, so, you know, just from a high level perspective from, from my view, so you, you take our network and just take a small slice of it. We have copper deployed to the home. We have fiber to the no, which is a combination of fiber and copper that was deployed. And what we've done is come back and we're saying we need to replace it with fiber. And all three of those costs are sitting on our books right now. You would only put fiber out there right now. And, and so, so those adjustments that Carl's talking about, those excess costs, that, that's one aspect of the RCN. The other aspect of it is, is, is fiber is a passive network. Copper, has got electricity running through, it's got a VRAD in it, it's got a lot of electronics. We have all those excess costs that we're having to maintain. On top of that, Jim mentioned, you know, states have relaxed a lot of the rules from a regulatory perspective, but under, under 214, we're still required to keep that network out there until the last POTS customer leaves or we're able to get um, the FCC to allow us to retire. So we're having to maintain that network on top of maintaining the fiber network. So all those things kind of come into play and, and, and tie into what Carl's talking about from a reporting perspective. We need to at least identify those so that when somebody's looking at it from an assessor perspective, they can go through and, and see what adjustments are warranted and so forth. And the easiest way to do that is, is essentially comparing what it would cost today to what your historical filings uh, show. Um, you know, again, in this pictorial relationship, as, as Gary was saying, AT&T and, and other telecommunication companies are trying to figure out how to best, with the lowest cost necessary, deploy a network that, that keeps up with this, this uh, additional broadband ca capacity. So, I mean, we, we saw earlier a, a fixed wireless uh, provider um, doing it successfully in a, in a very small area. Um, but you think about in a very large footprint and you have kind of a finite set of capacity, everybody has finite dollars, but you, you, you have opportunities to where to invest, right? So it's, it's um, 
you have a re required rate of return and you say, look, I'll invest in this much money in a new subdivision because I can get a fair rate of return on that, but if I go and put a fixed wireless in an area of which I cannot make a fair rate of return or my required rate of return, I should say, I just simply won't do it. And so, um, you know, even in areas where, you know, we talked about uh, fixed wireless being an option for rural areas, um, in some areas it is, um, there's some areas where it's not, like uh, AT&T in, in Oklahoma and Missouri decided that we will just simply give up our network uh, and let others come in in that CAF2 funding um, to, to provide that, uh, that functionality in the future. So uh, when they could have... But we're still having to incur those operating costs. Exactly. So, I mean, then the regulation then comes in and says, well, you can't kind of walk away. You kind of continue to maintain it because you're effectively... Um, required by the regulations that are in place, like a, a multiple regulations that require you to stay and, and maintain your network. So even though you're not making any money, congratulations, you get to stay, right? So um, but so that's that's a challenge with kind of a legacy telecommunication provider is um, they can't necessarily be as nimble as just simply going out there and, and doing, uh, you know, what economically you can do in, in certain circumstances. You're, you're duplicating your network. You're putting fiber on top of... of uh, of a copper and and uh, really increasing that that, that filing cost that, that the assessor is seeing. So um, this is uh, just an example of kind of what happens with this historical cost. You you put in in this example, we'll call it 1.4 million of original installed costs in a particular area, but then you come back and you you upgrade it. You do some node splits and you do some capitalized repairs and and your accumulated costs uh, that have occurred and that it's required to put on your, your, your uh, fixed assets is $2.4 million, when in reality, if you were to do it all over again and more efficiently, uh, it'd cost you $1.3 million. So that's kind of the disconnect that, uh, that um, happens with the, uh, those issues. The other thing that we talked about was the optimal deployment versus of a replacement plant versus a suboptimal deployment of a, of a um, Kind of a current plan. So, this is an example of a, a cable system where it has 4,400 miles of cable deployed, but if you were to deploy it today, you would only need 3,400 miles to actually um, provide the same level of service, if not better service, to the existing customers that are, that are there today. And then, uh, just pictorially, we talked about this kind of positive trending versus negative trending. Um, you know, here's an example of, uh, I use the, the California Assessor Handbook uh, trend, uh, industrial machinery and equipment goes up, right? Because inflation goes, has gone up over time. But in reality, if you look at kind of the, the equipment prices that is uh, published by the Federal Reserve, those prices have gone down dramatically over time. So those are, those are realistic um, adjustments that, that should be made as opposed to using kind of mass appraisal trends that, uh, that have been used in the past. You know, even when you get to a replacement cost new and you have provided, let's say you decide to do a replacement cost new and it's, it's fiber to the prem because that's the lowest, that's the most economic solution. Well, you've got a much better system, right? So you then have to take that adjustment of the replacement cost new and then make an adjustment for what, what we call equivalent utility. It's more functional than what's out there. So in order for it to be a good starting point, you need to take an equivalency adjustment to, to adjust it down to what is, a f the, what is the functionality that it is out there in the system. So those, those are just a few things that we look at um, as, as appraisers, but uh, any other comments or thoughts or questions? Yeah, questions, Jim. Uh, first question, John, did you get your socks from T-Mobile? I see the Sprint and... Uh, those those are not T-Mobile. That's, that's not Magenta. It's closed. No, I was just those curious. Are, but the real question... The I real think question. he hasn't changed them since Christmas. They're yeah. balloon animals. <laughs> yeah. So the question, it those leads to my Carl. question, is as Steve deploys his 5G network, how do, how do you guys, being that you're actually the ones that support his 5G network, see that because he will now compete against you on your residential broadband. Um, so he's going to lease your network, your fiber network, and now compete. How, do, you, do you see that as a, an issue going forward? I mean, I think it's definitely an issue. Um, saw some 
comments by some of our senior executives at an investor conference recently, and he was asked that very <clears throat> same question, and his answer was, it's not going to be able to be offered um, cheaper from the company perspective, um, and it's not going to be able to offer faster speeds. So they're viewing it as any other overbuilder who would come in, whether it would be Google Fiber, um, an existing telecom, uh, a new market entrant. Um, they're, they're viewing it the same way as, as any other overbuilder. The other thing, the other thing that goes on, and, and I think you guys are doing it, we have HBO Max rolling out. We have our own content. Um, and so to the extent you have on top products you can differentiate yourself with, that also helps you to compete. At least that's... Right, and that's, that goes back to what I was talking about earlier, our product differentiation. We're trying to, to make our services um, as unique and value-add to our customers as possible, um, and that helps make the customer stickier. Yeah, and I, that was what I was just going to say. It's the stickiness of the customer. So with adding wireless, uh, both Comcast and Charter Spectrum, um, it's, it's that making it hard for the customer to leave, um, giving them, uh, and it's going to come down to price and how reliable that product is. And marketing that pretty magenta color. Right? So uh, one more question. We've got time for one more. Once, twice. Uh, panel, Gary, John, Carl, Christian, thank you so much.